It's a time of high brinkmanship and high stakes in Washington over the debt talks. Good evening, I'm Jeffrey Brown. And I'm Gwen Eiffel. In just a few moments, President Barack Obama will address the nation from the East Room of the White House. It will be the seventh time he has done so since taking office. Front and center tonight, the administration's charged and tense negotiations with congressional Republicans over the country's $14 trillion debt ceiling, the amount the federal government is allowed to borrow, with a looming deadline of August 2nd and the threat of a potential first-ever default. We'll carry the president's speech in its entirety, as well as a response that will follow from Speaker of the House John Boehner. His direct negotiations with the president broke down last Friday. We have reached this point after weeks of face-to-face -face meetings at the White House and the Capitol, with many hints of a deal, then no deal, deal, and then again, where we are at the moment, no deal. President Obama is expected tonight to warn again, even more forcefully, about the potential damage to the nation of a credit ratings downgrade and a national default, and to outline his version of compromise through a mix of spending cuts and revenue increases. The president is approaching now. Here, President of the United States. Good evening. Tonight I want to talk about the debate we've been having in Washington over the national debt, a debate that directly affects the lives of all Americans. For the last decade, we've spent more money than we take in. In the year 2000, the government had a budget surplus. But instead of using it to pay off our debt, the money was spent on trillions of dollars in new tax cuts, while two wars and an expensive prescription drug program were simply added to our nation's credit card. As a result, the deficit was on track to top $1 trillion the year I took office. To make matters worse, the recession meant that there was less money coming in, and it required us to spend even more on tax cuts for middle-class families to spur the economy, on unemployment insurance, on aid to states so we could prevent more teachers and firefighters and police officers from being laid off. These emergency steps also added to the deficit. Now, every family knows a little credit card debt is manageable. But if we stay on the current path, our growing debt could cost us jobs and do serious damage to the economy. More of our tax dollars will go toward paying off the interest on our loans. Businesses will be less likely to open up shop and hire workers in a country that can't balance its books. Interest rates could climb for everyone who borrows money, the homeowner with a mortgage, the student with a college loan, the corner store that wants to expand. And we won't have enough money to make job-creating investments in things like education and infrastructure, or pay for vital programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Because neither party is blameless for the decisions that led to this problem, both parties have a responsibility to solve it. And over the last several months, that's what we've been trying to do. I won't bore you with the details of every plan or proposal, but basically the debate has centered around two different approaches. The first approach says, let's live within our means by making serious historic cuts in government spending. Let's cut domestic spending to the lowest level it's been since Dwight Eisenhower was president. Let's cut defense spending at the Pentagon by hundreds of billions of dollars. Let's cut out waste and fraud in health care programs like Medicare. And at the same time, let's make modest adjustments so that Medicare is still there for future generations. Finally, let's ask the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations to give up some of their breaks in the tax code and special deductions. This balanced approach asks everyone to give a little without requiring anyone to sacrifice too much. It would reduce the deficit by around $4 trillion and put us on a path to pay down our debt. And the cuts wouldn't happen so abruptly that they'd be a drag on our economy or prevent us from helping small businesses and middle-class families get back on their feet right now. This approach is also bipartisan. While many in my own party aren't happy with the painful cuts it makes, enough will be willing to accept them if the burden is fairly shared. While Republicans might like to see deeper cuts and no revenue at all, there are many in the Senate who have said, yes, I'm willing to put politics aside and consider this approach because I care about solving the problem. 
And to his credit, this is the kind of approach the Republican Speaker of the House, John Boehner, was working on with me over the last several weeks. The only reason this balanced approach isn't on its way to becoming law right now is because a significant number of Republicans in Congress are insisting on a different approach, a cuts-only approach, an approach that doesn't ask the wealthiest Americans or biggest corporations to contribute anything at all. And because nothing is asked of those at the top of the income scale, such an approach would close the deficit only with more severe cuts to programs we all care about, cuts that place a greater burden on working families. So the debate right now isn't about whether we need to make tough choices. Democrats and Republicans agree on the amount of deficit reduction we need. The debate is about how it should be done. Most Americans, regardless of political party, don't understand how we can ask a senior citizen to pay more for her Medicare before we ask a corporate jet owner or the oil companies to give up tax breaks that other companies don't get. How can we ask a student to pay more for college before we ask hedge fund managers to stop paying taxes at a lower rate than their secretaries? How can we slash funding for education and clean energy before we ask people like me to give up tax breaks we don't need and didn't ask for? That's not right. It's not fair. We all want a government that lives within its means, but there are still things we need to pay for as a country. Things like new roads and bridges, weather satellites and food inspection, services to veterans, and medical research. And keep in mind that under a balanced approach, the 98 percent of Americans who make under $250,000 would see no tax increases at all. None. In fact, I want to extend the payroll tax cut for working families. What we're talking about under a balanced approach is asking Americans whose incomes have gone up the most over the last decade, millionaires and billionaires, to share in the sacrifice everyone else has to make. And I think these patriotic Americans are willing to pitch in. In fact, over the last few decades, they've pitched in every time we passed a bipartisan deal to reduce the deficit. The first time a deal was passed, a predecessor of mine made the case for a balanced approach by saying this. Would you rather reduce deficits and interest rates by raising revenue from those who are not now paying their fair share, or would you rather accept larger budget deficits, higher interest rates, and higher unemployment? And I think I know your answer. Those words were spoken by Ronald Reagan. But today, many Republicans in the House refuse to consider this kind of balanced approach an approach that was pursued not only by President Reagan, but by the first President Bush, by President Clinton, by myself, and by many Democrats and Republicans in the United States Senate. So we're left with a stalemate. Now, what makes today's stalemate so dangerous is that it has been tied to something known as the debt ceiling, a term that most people outside of Washington have probably never heard of before. Understand, raising the debt ceiling does not allow Congress to spend more money. It simply gives our country the ability to pay the bills that Congress has already racked up. In the past, raising the debt ceiling was routine. Since the 1950s, Congress has always passed it, and every president has signed it. President Reagan did it 18 times. George W. Bush did it seven times. And we have to do it by next Tuesday, August 2nd, or else we won't be able to pay all of our bills. Unfortunately, for the past several weeks, Republican House members have essentially said that the only way they'll vote to prevent America's first ever default is if the rest of us agree to their deep spending cuts only approach. If that happens and we default, we would not have enough money to pay all of our bills, bills that include monthly Social Security checks, veterans benefits, and the government contracts we've signed with thousands of businesses. For the first time in history, our country's AAA credit rating would be downgraded, leaving investors around the world to wonder whether the United States is still a good bet. Interest rates would skyrocket on credit cards, on mortgages, and on car loans, which amounts to a huge tax hike on the American people. 
we would risk sparking a deep economic crisis, this one caused almost entirely by Washington. So defaulting on our obligations is a reckless and irresponsible outcome to this debate. And Republican leaders say that they agree we must avoid default. But the new approach that Speaker Boehner unveiled today, which would temporarily extend the debt ceiling in exchange for spending cuts, would force us to once again face the threat of default just six months from now. In other words, it doesn't solve the problem. First of all, a six-month extension of the debt ceiling might not be enough to avoid a credit downgrade and the higher interest rates that all Americans would have to pay as a result. We know what we have to do to reduce our deficits. There's no point in putting the economy at risk by kicking the can further down the road. But there's an even greater danger to this approach. Based on what we've seen these past few weeks, we know what to expect six months from now. The House of Representatives will once again refuse to prevent default unless the rest of us accept their cuts-only approach. Again, they will refuse to ask the wealthiest Americans to give up their tax cuts or deductions. Again, they will demand harsh cuts to programs like Medicare. And once again, the economy will be held captive unless they get their way. This is no way to run the greatest country on Earth. It's a dangerous game that we've never played before, and we can't afford to play it now. Not when the jobs and livelihoods of so many families are at stake. We can't allow the American people to become collateral damage to Washington's political warfare. And Congress now has one week left to act, and there are still paths forward. The Senate has introduced a plan to avoid default, which makes a down payment on deficit reduction and ensures that we don't have to go through this again in six months. I think that's a much better approach, although serious deficit reduction would still require us to tackle the tough challenges of entitlement and tax reform. Either way, I've told leaders of both parties that they must come up with a fair compromise in the next few days that can pass both houses of Congress and a compromise that I can sign. I'm confident we can reach this compromise. Despite our disagreements, Republican leaders and I have found common ground before, and I believe that enough members of both parties will ultimately put politics aside and help us make progress. Now, I realize that a lot of the new members of Congress and I don't see eye to eye on many issues, but we were each elected by some of the same Americans for some of the same reasons. Yes, many want government to start living within its means. And many are fed up with a system in which the deck seems stacked against middle-class Americans in favor of the wealthiest few. But do you know what people are fed up with most of all? They're fed up with a town where compromise has become a dirty word. They work all day long, many of them scraping by just to put food on the table. And when these Americans come home at night, bone-tired, and turn on the news, all they see is the same partisan three-ring circus here in Washington. They see leaders who can't seem to come together and do what it takes to make life just a little bit better for ordinary Americans. They're offended by that, and they should be. The American people may have voted for divided government, but they didn't vote for a dysfunctional government. So I'm asking you all to make your voice heard. If you want a balanced approach to reducing the deficit, let your member of Congress know. If you believe we can solve this problem through compromise, send that message. America, after all, has always been a grand experiment in compromise. As a democracy made up of every race and religion, where every belief and point of view is welcomed, we have put to the test time and again the proposition at the heart of our founding that out of many, we are one. We've engaged in fierce and passionate debates about the issues of the day. But from slavery to war, from civil liberties to questions of economic justice, we have tried to live by the words that Jefferson once wrote, every man cannot have his way in all things. Without this mutual disposition, we are disjointed individuals, but not a society. 
History is scattered with the stories of those who held fast to rigid ideologies and refused to listen to those who disagreed. But those are not the Americans we remember. We remember the Americans who put country above self and set personal grievances aside for the greater good. We remember the Americans who held this country together during its most difficult hours, who put aside pride and party to form a more perfect union. That's who we remember. That's who we need to be right now. The entire world is watching. So let's seize this moment to show why the United States of America is still the greatest nation on Earth. Not just because we can still keep our word and meet our obligations, but because we can still come together as one nation. Thank you. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. As President Obama speaking from the East Room of the White House, we will hear shortly from House Speaker Boehner. But first, some insight from our political editor, David Chalian, who joins us tonight from New York. David, it was interesting to hear the president use terms like dangerous game, collateral damage, political warfare, a partisan three-ring circus. He was being speaking over the heads of Washington and into American living rooms. There's no doubt about it. In fact, I think when what we saw here was uh, a Harvard-trained lawyer making his closing argument in, in this battle uh, and trying to teach the American people what the stakes are here, even including that urging of sort of calling your members of Congress. Uh, if you're somebody who gets a Social Security check or you're a veteran that gets veterans benefits, the president was trying to speak to you, asking you to get engaged uh, and call your member of Congress uh, to support his point of view. He lays out um, his plan is very balanced. I'm sure what we'll hear from Speaker Boehner doesn't describe uh, the Obama plan that way. How unusual it is it to hear a president come and talk about what is basically a legislative dispute in a primetime national address? I do think that part of the words you were describing earlier get at exactly uh, this point. It is historic. It's not that often we see a presidential address followed by a response by the opposition party if it's not State of the Union night. But we are a week away from this deadline, and so the stakes are so high, Gwen. Uh, the president didn't want to lose this opportunity. He feels he's been sort of winning the message war here, trying to keep that upper hand, and he just didn't want to let any more time go by without, again, speaking to the American people and trying to make this argument. And briefly, today we saw new proposals from Senator Reid and from Congressman Boehner, Speaker Boehner, but we haven't really heard anything more from the White House except the, except the speech tonight. Are they closer or farther apart? Well, I think you heard it in the speech tonight when the president declared it still a stalemate, and that is where we stand at this day. Those two plans would be impossible to sort of bridge together in a conference uh, on Capitol Hill. They're still quite far apart. And, and what, it's going to take, what is it going to take to bring them back together? Another meeting, we think? We're going to be more to the White House? I think both chambers are going to go through this process now and, and okay, try David. to find where the openings here's, are. Okay, here's Speaker John Boehner. the Speaker Boehner. of the whole House, of the members of both parties that you elect. These are difficult times in the life of our nation. Millions are looking for work and have been for some time. And the spending binge going on in Washington is a big part of the reason why. Before I served in Congress, I ran a small business in Ohio. I was amazed at how different Washington, D.C. operated than every other business in America, where most American businesses make the hard choices to pay their bills and live within their means. In Washington, more spending and more debt is business as usual. Well, I've got news for Washington. Those days are over. President Obama came to Congress in January and requested business as usual. He had another routine increase in the national debt but we in the House said, not so fast. Here was a president asking for the largest debt increase in American history on the heels of the largest spending binge in American history. And here's what we got for that massive spending binge. A new health care bill that most Americans never asked for. A stimulus bill that was more effective in producing material for late night comedians than it was in producing jobs. And a national debt that has gotten so out of hand, it sparked a crisis without precedent in my lifetime or yours. The United States cannot default on its debt obligations. The jobs and savings of too many Americans are at stake. What we told the President in January was this, that the American people will not accept an increase in the debt limit without significant spending cuts and reforms. And over the last six months, we've done our best to convince the President to partner with us to do something dramatic to change the fiscal trajectory of our country something that will boost confidence in our economy, 
renew a measure of faith in our government, and help small businesses get back on track. Last week, the House passed such a plan, and with bipartisan support. It's called the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act. It cuts and caps government spending and paves the way for a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution, which we believe is the best way to stop Washington from spending money that it doesn't have. Before we even passed the bill in the House, the President said he would veto it. I want you to know I made a sincere effort to work with the President to identify a path forward that would implement the principles of cut, cap, and balance in a manner that could secure bipartisan support and be signed into law. And I'll tell you, I gave it my all. Unfortunately, the President would not take yes for an answer. Even when we thought we might be close on an agreement, the President's demands changed. The President has often said we need a balanced approach, which in Washington means we spend more and you pay more. Having run a small business, I know those tax increases will destroy jobs. The President is adamant that we cannot make fundamental changes to our entitlement programs. As a father of two daughters, I know these programs won't be there for them and their kids unless significant action is taken now. And the sad truth is that the President wanted a blank check six months ago, and he wants a blank check today. This is just not going to happen. You see, there's no stalemate here in Congress. The House passed a bill to raise the debt limit with bipartisan support. And this week, while the Senate is struggling to pass a bill filled with phony accounting and Washington gimmicks, we're going to pass another bill, one that was developed with the support of the bipartisan leadership of the U.S. Senate. Obviously, I expect that bill can and will pass the Senate and be sent to the President for a signature. And if the President signs it, the crisis atmosphere that he has created will simply disappear. The debt limit will be raised, spending will be cut by more than $1 trillion, and a serious bipartisan committee of the Congress will begin the hard but necessary work of dealing with the tough challenges our nation faces. The individuals doing this work will not be outsiders, but elected representatives of the people doing the job they were elected to do, as outlined in the Constitution. Those decisions should be made based on how they're going to affect people who are struggling to get a job not how they will affect some politicians' chances of getting reelected. This debate isn't about President Obama and House Republicans. It isn't about Congress and the White House. It's about what's standing between the American people and the future we seek for ourselves and our families. You know, I've always believed the bigger the government, the smaller the people. And right now, we've got a government so big and so expensive, it's sapping the drive out of our people and keeping our economy from running at full capacity. The solution to this crisis is not complicated. If you're spending more money than you're taking in, you need to spend less of it. There's no symptom of big government more menacing than our debt. Break its grip, and we begin to liberate our economy and our future. We are up to the task, and I hope President Obama will join us in this work. God bless you and your family, and God bless the United States of America. That was Speaker John Boehner speaking from the ceremonial offices at the U.S. Capitol. Now we go back to News Hour political editor David Chalian. We have a little bit of warring bully pulpits. I think that we heard words from him like blank check and gimmicks to talk, describe what the Democrats are talking about. David, is that what you heard? Uh, he, he did say gimmicks, and, and that was an important word, Gwen, because that's how he's describing what Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, and the Democrats in the Senate have proposed here. Both chambers now, the Republicans in the House, the Democrats in the Senate, are actually now proposing a cuts-only package to, in order to raise the debt, the debt ceiling. But they go about those cuts very differently. And Speaker Boehner is saying that the Democrats in the Senate are relying on gimmicks by saying that they're going to cut a trillion dollars by unwinding the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and that that shouldn't be part of budgeting this, this process here. The other thing that I thought Speaker Boehner said that was quite interesting was that he kept saying that this is a crisis that the president has created. So you do see some of that blame game going on, as you were saying, from each of these bully pulpits. Yeah, he said this, there, this was no stalemate in Congress, even though after watching the two plans put out there that neither agreed on today, you would have thought the stalemate was happening somewhere. 
<laughs> right. I, I, I think that the speaker is trying to avoid uh, sort of being labeled as intransigent. And he has a tough job. He has these House Republicans in his conference who, who simply, many of them won't vote to increase the debt limit no matter what, but simply don't want to budge in any way uh, whatsoever here. And so what Speaker Boehner is sort of, what you hear there is him trying to put off the blame elsewhere. He doesn't want to accept it all on, on his turf. We got about 10 seconds left. What has to happen next? They're both saying opposite things. Well, they both have to get to their sort of conferences, figure out what can pass both chambers. The country did vote for divided government last year, and now it's up to them to make it work, as the president has said, and it has to be something he can sign. David Chalian, political editor, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you.